Good morning. Um, I was fortunate enough to have attended the second A4M meeting 16 years ago. Back in 1994, I listened with fascination as I heard for the first time terms such as nanobotic, uh, nanorobotic therapy, nanotechnology, and stem cells as applied to anti-aging medicine. What was the future in 1994 is becoming the reality in 2010, because at the 2010 meeting, uh, we have an all-day seminar in stem cell therapies that was given. There have been uh, several meetings uh, and lectures about stem cell therapies. Um, and I heard the following quote from Dr. Sharon McQuellen uh, yesterday. It is plausible that in the near term, we'll be able to treat most degenerative diseases with a patient's own stem cells as the norm rather than as a groundbreaking procedure, beginning now. So what was the future in 1994 is the reality today. There is even uh, at least one chemotherapy drug that can be administered with uh, nanospheres, and there are many others in the research and development uh, pipeline. So I'd like to invite you to join me for the next few minutes as we take a brief trip, starting with the latest advances uh, available today, and travel into the future of anti-aging medicine over the next couple of decades. There will be uh, three bridges to the future of anti-aging medicine. I've proposed that significant advances in human longevity will occur by passing over three bridges. Uh, the first bridge is the medicine of today. The second bridge is biotechnology. And the third bridge is largely nanotechnology. And the idea that I presented in my last couple of books were that uh, patients will be able to achieve much longer lives than they have in the past by keeping themselves in good health, taking advantage of the best of medicine today, so that they're in good health for when biotechnology is available between uh, approximately now and the next 15 years until about 2025. And in 2025, uh, nanotechnology should be available uh, and uh, keep us alive for even longer periods of time. The main uh, hallmark of the medicine that we practice today is diagnose and treat. And this term, diagnose and treat, comes from the future of medicine by Stephen Shimp, who provided a lot of ideas for what is going to happen in the near future for medicine. However, this uh, diagnose and treat paradigm still represents a major advancement over the type of medicine we had uh, just uh, a few decades ago. Since prior to 1940, uh, doctors didn't even have diagnose and treat available to them. They were more like the Seth Rogen movie, uh, Observe and Report. Uh, there was very little that they could do for their patients. However, the diagnosis and the diagnose and treat uh, paradigm does have a lot of problems, as we'll see. And I think that they relate to what's referred to as the rule of 80-20. The rule of 80-20 was uh, initially promulgated by an economist named Pareto in Italy about 100 years ago when he observed that about 80 percent of the land in uh, the town he lived in and also in surrounding towns and in the entire country was held in the hands of 20 percent of the population. And he uh, promoted this as the rule of 80-20, and it's been found to apply to many different economic parameters. Uh, for instance, world gross domestic product follows the rule of 80-20, and we see that the richest 20 percent of people in the world control a little bit more than 80 percent of the income of the world. And then the remaining 20 percent of the population, uh, excuse me, the remaining 80 percent of the population only has 20 percent of the assets. This doesn't only apply to economics, it applies to business. When Microsoft uh, releases a new version of Windows, uh, they'll often have glitches and bugs. They find that if they can identify the worst 20 percent of the bugs and fix those, they will have solved 80 percent of the problems. Uh, so that's what they typically do. Uh, in uh, the four-hour work week, Tim Ferriss has noted that we tend to be inefficient in our use of time at, in uh, meetings, and that 80 percent of a typical business meeting is only spent on 20 percent of the agenda. I got to thinking about this rule of 80-20 and wondered if it might not apply to medicine as well. And as I began to think about this more and more, 
I saw that there were many similarities to the rule of 80-20 in medicine. For instance, when a cardiologist performs a catheterization and angiogram on a patient, and they discover that there's a lesion that's 50, 60, or 70 percent obstructive, they don't typically recommend a surgical treatment. But when that magical point about 75 or 80 percent is reached, then at that point they recommend that the patient undergo some type of stenting uh, or uh, a bypass procedure. When uh, a patient uh, has chronic kidney disease, uh, they lose nephrons successively over the years. It's really the creatinine stays about the same until there's been a loss of about 80 percent of the functioning uh, nephrons, in which case the, the knee of the curve is reached, uh, the creatinine starts to rise, uh, patients need to see nephrologists, and they're looking at uh, dialysis in the not too distant future. So in other words, the body has enormous capacity to tolerate uh, a loss of the functioning cells before there's any clinical manifestations. There's a great buffering capacity. A patient who smokes cigarettes, for instance, and destroys their alveoli can smoke for 10 years, 20 years, uh, sometimes even 30 years before they become uh, symptomatic. But when that point that 80 percent of the alveoli are destroyed, that patient uh, will begin to, to notice that they're increasingly short of breath. They may need to go on supplemental oxygen. Uh, and the buffering capacity of the lung has been, has been lost. So the rule of 80-20 uh, also applies in the case of a diabetic. When a diabetic is finally diagnosed and the blood sugar, the fasting blood sugar is over 130, which is how we diagnose it, at that point, 80% uh, of the uh, functioning islet cells have already been destroyed. So there's this long pre-morbid period during which a patient doesn't really understand that they're having a problem, but damage is occurring. Uh, that we're not able to see. Uh, the classic example is this. We, we, we learned in medical school we can look at the 2-3 DPG oxygen oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. And uh, if we look at this, we see that when the uh, PO2 is 180, this corresponds to a hemoglobin saturation of 100 percent. But when there's a over a 50% drop, a 55% drop down to a PO2 of 80, there's only a 4% loss in saturation. And when we go all the way down to a PO2 of 40, which you'd have to go to the Himalayas to get that as the ambient PO2, there's a 78% drop in the uh, uh, oxygen. However, the saturation of the hemoglobin only drops by 25%. So this rule of 80-20 really uh, applies to many of our physiologic sim uh, systems, and I think that there's a lot that we can learn about how the uh, rule of 80-20 applies to the type of bridge one medicine that, that we're practicing today. 